So hi, uh, I'm Pekka Hosoi from MIT. Um, welcome, this is the master class on locomotion and I, I think I should probably say congratulations because people have told me it was very competitive to get into these master classes, so congratulations to all of you. Um, so let's see, so before I start, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Oh, and I should also say, you should stop me and ask me questions at any time because um, we're gonna be here for two and a half hours and if you only listen to me for two and a half hours, it's gonna be a very long two and a half hours. So please interrupt me at any time. Um, okay, so uh, my background is um, both of my degrees are in physics. Uh, the first from uh, my undergrad from Princeton and my um, grad from University of Chicago. Um, and I knew um, sort of, uh, I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to study fluid mechanics. Um, and then I discovered that um, in the States, after I'd already gotten my PhD in physics, that in, in the States, um, fluid mechanics isn't really done in physics departments. It's done in applied math departments and in engineering departments. So, um, so I moved to a, uh, an applied math department, um, uh, Courant and MIT. So I did two postdocs, one at Courant and one at MIT. And um, then my first faculty position was at Harvey Mudd College. Um, and then I moved to MIT in mechanical engineering. And I've been there for about 10 years. So um, I'm now, I guess, technically an engineer, although I was born and raised a physicist. So, um, so that was the that's the first half of the story. Um, so in my PhD and in my postdocs, I studied things like thin films and uh, instabilities in thin films, which was great and very interesting. Um, and then I showed up at MIT for my first faculty job, young junior faculty, and I went and I sat in my office and I, you know, I was there like two days, so there was nothing on my desk, there was nothing on my shelves, I was sitting at my desk, and there's a knock on the door, so I go and answer the door, and it's a student, and the student comes in and says, oh, Professor Hosoi, I went to your website, I've read all about your research, I really, really, really want to work with you, and I thought, this is fantastic. I've only been here two days, and already everybody knows what I'm working on, and they want to come work in my group, this is amazing. So I said, well, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to build robots. And I said, what? <laughs> I have no idea how to build a robot. I've never built a robot in my life. So I thought, okay, well, clearly there's a misunderstanding, so I said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't build robots. Bye bye. Okay, so um, so that was a little disappointing. And then ne the next day, there's a knock on my door. It's another student, Professor Soy. I really want to work with you. I've read all about your research on your website. It's really fantastic. Oh, that's wonderful. What do you want to work on? I want to build robots. I went, what? <laughs> oh, I don't build robots. Okay, so this happened to me something you know, like three or four times. And I thought, oh, there must be another Professor Hosoi at MIT who builds robots, because otherwise, why would people keep coming? So I went online and I checked it out, um, and there, there is no other Professor Hosoi that builds robots. So I finally figured out that it's just that the students at MIT really like building robots. <laughs> <laughs> and after about a week of this, I thought, boy, you know what? I'm gonna have to learn to build robots or I am not gonna survive here. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, how can I combine fluid mechanics and robotics? And that's how I got into locomotion, because if you're gonna combine the two, you have to start thinking about swimming, you have to start thinking about crawling, you have to start thinking about digging. Um, so that's how I got to where I am today. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a couple of different kinds of locomotion in my plenary talk on Wednesday. Um, but today, what I'm gonna tell you guys is something a little bit newer. So it's uh, some things that we did last year and then some things that we're in the process of that hasn't been published yet. So that's what we'll do on, uh, in the second half. Um, okay, so that was the introduction. Um, so uh, today I'm gonna start by talking about locomotion in granular media, which is basically digging. So the question is, how do you, how do you dig through sand or soil or other kinds of, uh, or dirt, basically? Um, and there are lots of people who study this, and there are lots of animals that do this. Um, so let me, in fact, just move up forward to the animals. So um, I'm gonna just show you a few movies of some of my favorite biological burrowers. Um, and I put them on this plot. You, I mean, there's lots of ways you can arrange these. Um, but I basically, I have one axis here, which is gonna be the size of the thing that's digging relative to the size of the grains of the material. Um, and this axis here, which sort of says, um, this is things that move very slowly, so you're dominated by friction. This is things that um, are, uh, move fast, so you're, you're uh, dominated by inertia. So you can think of this as some kind of a granular uh, Reynolds number. Oh, actually, by the way, I should ask you, so how many people here are, consider themselves sort of in a fluids field? Oh, good, excellent. How about uh, soft condensed matter? Good, oh, I think I hit everybody. Did I miss anybody? Who did I miss? Biomechanics, no. What, yeah, what do, you, what do you consider? Oh, perfect, perfect. Okay, yeah, okay, so this is good. Okay, so good. 
perfect audience for this. You are well selected. Um, OK, so let me show you uh, how some things dig. The first movie I'll show you is uh, this. So this is a C. Elegans uh, moving through glass beads. So this is a movie taken by Sonny Young, who is now at uh, Virginia Tech. So C. Elegans, it's a, it's a little worm. It's a few millimeters uh, big. Um, Interestingly, so C. elegans is actually one of these model organisms that people used to study swimming. So they throw them in water and they videotape them and they watch them swim. Um, it turns out that, that water is not their, native, their natural habitat. Their natural habitat is actually soil. So they're not very good swimmers. Um, but they are very good at digging. So um, in fact, they're much more efficient when you put them in grains than when you put them in a, in a viscous fluid. OK, so that's a, um, a C. elegans going through particles. Um, here, this is uh, another very famous example. So this is um, as called, so a lizard called a sandfish. So this is a movie that was made by Dan Goldman's group at Virginia Tech. So what you'll see, so this is a sandfish that's, uh, this is a, an x-ray image. So right here in the middle of the thing, this is, um, this is sort of the edge of a platform. So when it runs across here, it's running on solid ground. And then here, it dives off the edge of the platform into the sand. And so now you're looking at an x-ray image under the sand, and you can see that it switches gates when it goes from the running to the, to the swimming gate, and it dives underneath. By the way, I talked to Dan about how he got these images, and he, uh, he found a dental x-ray on eBay that he bought and set that up in his lab. <laughs> Works great. <laughs> OK, so, uh, so that's the sandfish. Um, then uh, another example here, this one here. This is a, a worm that was studied by Kelly Dorgan. So um, she was looking at worms. Um, going through gels. So this is a worm going through gel, and she found that one of the tricks that worms use to go through gel to minimize their energy requirements is they, they crack the gel. So they, they make a crack at the, sort of at their nose, and then the crack propagates through the gel, which makes it easier to peel the, peel the sort of two halves apart and for the animal to go through the gel. Um, but the one we're going to talk about today um, is none of these. We're going to think about clams and uh, how do clams dig. So clams. Um, so this was, a, this was a project that was started by my student, Amos Winter. Um, Amos was doing an internship with a company called Bluefin Robotics. And Bluefin Robotics, they make um, small underwater uh, vehicles, autonomous underwater vehicles. And small is, of course, a relative word. So small to them means um, 20 feet long or something like that. Okay. So that's a small underwater vehicle. Um, and uh, the problem with the, the challenge they have is that they have very limited power and they have very limited space. Um, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to be able to anchor these, these vehicles. And so Amos started thinking about what kinds of anchoring strategies can you use if you have very little power available and very little space. Um, and in the process of, the, as a process of that, he got, uh, he got interested in understanding how clams anchor themselves and how clams dig. So um, in particular, he was interested in the Atlantic uh, razor clam. Actually, I think this is a Pacific razor clam. But this is, this is a video that I just pulled off of YouTube of a clam digging. Uh, so there it is. Uh, they're pretty fast. They go at something like a centimeter per second. Um, and you'll see in a minute here, he'll eject everything out of the siphon. Um, Amos called these guys um, the Ferraris of bivalves because they're so fast. Um, and it's actually been well known for a long time how these clams dig. So a clam basically consists of a shell. Here's a shell. And the foot. So the foot is a soft, um, sort of a soft organ. Um, the shell just has two pieces that look like this. Okay? Um, and they basically go through this series of motions to dig. So this is a picture that came out of a book called Locomotion of Soft-Bodied Animals by Truman, which was made in 1967, written in 1967. So again, this has been known for a long time. Um, and they do the following. So they have a shell. So your shell can open and close. That's about it. Um, so suppose this thing is submerged in the sand. Um, the first thing it does is it relaxes its muscles. And when it relaxes its muscles, there's a hinge in the shell that makes it want to open. OK, so you relax it, and then the hinge opens. So now it's braced against the sand. OK, then the next thing it does is it takes the foot, which is that soft organ, and wiggles it around to, to, um, to sort of insert it beneath the shell. So now the foot is sitting down here. OK, then the next thing it does is it closes the shell to squeeze water into the foot, so now the foot blows up like a balloon. So now you have a second anchor point down here. OK, and then it contracts to pull the shell down. So it's basically a two-step ratcheting process where it just goes down like this. Good? Everybody good with that? OK. Um, and they're extremely good diggers. They can dig into just about any kind of environment. Um, so for example, this is um, one of the places that we hunted for the clams. This was one of my students that was hunting clams. 
Um, they tell me that it took him 30 minutes to dig him out, but he got out, so, uh, so we haven't lost any yet. Um, so this is just off the coast of Boston. Um, and so we went, we went and harvested all these clams to, um, to sort of to study them. Um, okay, but before I go and, uh, and talk about real clams, let me tell you about um, a toy model for, um, for digging. Um, okay, so here's the, here's the toy model for, for a digging clam. So uh, imagine that process that I just described. So remember, you have two ratchets. You have a shell which can open and close. You have a foot can, which can open and close. And then you can change the distance between the two. Um, we said, well, let's do something like this. So this is going to be our, our toy clam. So our toy clam consists of a cylinder. And the cylinder, you can change the radius as a function of time, right? So that's opening and closing the shell. It also has a foot on the end, which, so you can change the radius of the, of the foot as a function of time. And you can change the distance between them, right? So you can change this length, OK? And all of this is dictated by the clam. So the clam picks whatever kinematics it does and applies it. And then you see where it goes. Um, oh, and there's a conservation of mass principle because, of course, uh, like I said, when you close the shell, you squeeze water into the foot. So if the shell gets smaller, the foot has to get bigger. And if the foot gets bigger, the, you have to just move mass back and forth. Um, OK, so we prescribed something very simple. We just said, OK, let's just do something sinusoidal. Fine, these are going to be out of phase, and this is going to be um, uh, 90 degrees out of phase with, with those other two. Um, OK, so, um, so at this point, before I do the calculation, um, it's worth thinking about the analogy with low Reynolds number locomotion. So how many of you have, have studied low Reynolds number locomotion? Oh, good. OK, how many of you, uh, if I say the scallop theorem, how many people know what the scallop theorem is? OK, good. I have one person who knows the scallop theorem. Excellent. OK, so the scallop theorem. The scallop theorem was made popular by, um, by a guy called Purcell. Um, let's see, so Purcell. So his name is Purcell. OK, so Purcell uh, gave a lecture at Harvard in 1975 um, that was called Life at Low Reynolds Number. So Life at Low Reynolds Number. How many people have read the paper Life at Low Reynolds Number? Good. OK. I just made this master class wor worth, your, worth your time. You can all go now. That's all you need to know. <laughs> OK. So Life at Low Reynolds Number. This is a transcript of the lecture that Purcell gave at Harvard um, in, uh, in 1975. So it appeared in Scientific American, uh, Scientific, uh, American uh, in 1976. Okay, and, um, and in it, he, he just talks about some of the puzzling things that happen when you try to swim at low Reynolds number. This, is, this really is worth reading. It's short. It's only about four pages long, and it's very conversational because it's a transcript of, of the lecture that he gave. Um, okay, so one of the things that he points out is that, um, so if you look at the Navier-Stokes equations, let me, let me write the Navier-Stokes equations down. So, um, yeah, let me, let's start with Navier-Stokes. Okay, so uh, du dt plus uh, u dot, everybody knows, well, no. Half of the people in here knows, knows this because you're the fluids folks. Uh, so u dot grad u is equal to minus grad p. Probably need a row here uh, plus u del squared u. OK, so there's Navier-Stokes equations. This is conservation of momentum. u is the velocity field. Rho is the density of the fluid. p is the pressure. Mu is the viscosity. OK, um, at low Reynolds number, inertia goes away. So you don't have this. OK, and you are left with the Stokes equations. OK, so this is the Stokes equations right here. OK, so I'm not going to solve these right now. But the, the important thing to notice about the Stokes equations is that time does not appear explicitly anywhere in this equation. Right? So when I cross this off, I lost my time. Um, so I have no time in this equation, which means the only way you can get time dependence in this equation is by putting on time dependent boundary conditions. Okay? So, um, so that means that you, the time dependence of the boundary conditions completely determines the time dependence of the flow. Okay? And if you have a boundary condition, um, that you move it one way and then you move it back, you're always going to recover your initial state. Okay? Now, this happens to have um, pretty dire consequences for low Reynolds number swimming. And the reason it's called the scallop theorem is because Purcell illustrated this with a scallop. So he said, suppose you have a scallop. So a scallop is, everybody know what a scallop is? It's one of these two, it's got two shells, it does this. Okay? So if you're a scallop, this is the only thing you can do. Right? You have two rigid pieces connected by a hinge. If you're a scallop moving at low Reynolds number, you do something like this, and you move somewhere, 
And then the only thing you can do is close your shell, so you go back to exactly where you started. Right? And this is the only thing you can, I mean, you can, so you can't swim if you're a scallop at low Reynolds number. And in fact, this is always going to be true if you have something that's basically got only one degree of freedom and no chirality. Okay? So that's the, that's the trick for swimming at low Reynolds number, is somehow you have to break the time symmetry in the way you deform your body in order to generate any kind of net translation. Okay, so since after Purcell brought this up, there were, I'm going I'm to say literally hundreds of papers written where people were proposing different ways to break the scallop theorem. So they proposed all of these different shapes and ways that you could swim if you were tiny swimmers at low Reynolds number. So they, they had a three-link swimmer, which you know, does something like this. They have like something with a spiral. They've got, so you can look in the literature. There's many, many ways you can generate low Reynolds number swimming. And the interesting thing about the clam is it actually looks like one of those that was proposed, um, which is this guy right here. So this, this is something that's called the push me, pull you swimmer um, by these guys over here. Okay, and the push me, pull you swimmer um, that they proposed is as follows. You basically have two balls and you can change the size of the balls and you can change the length of the thing between them. Okay, so um, again, this is exactly what, what the clamp does, except it's got two spheres instead of a cylinder and a sphere. So you start here, so this is time going in this direction. First, you shrink this guy, so you shrink that guy. Um, then, you, uh, you extend the rod, and because this side is smaller than this side, there's less drag on this than on this, so this guy moves forward more than that one and moves backwards. Okay? Then you blow this one up and shrink this one, and again, you contract the rod, and again, since this guy is now smaller, there's less drag, so it moves more than this one does. So you end up with a net translation in that direction. Good? Okay, so that is one way in which the clam could actually move through through, these granular, through the granular materials is that it's actually breaking this, this symmetry by applying these non-reciprocal kinematics, okay? Because it first blows up one side and then the other. Um, it turns out that when you're going through granular, a granular material, you get an added bonus, okay? And the added bonus is as follows. So if, again, let's say I have something like this push me, pull you, if I shrink this guy, um, the sand right in here unpacks a little bit, so I have a little bit of fluidized region around this guy, whereas this guy is still in the packed region. Um, so now this guy is easier to move. The drag is reduced not only because it's smaller, but also because I've changed the material properties of the local material. Okay? So you get an added bonus if you're moving through a granular material. Okay? So both of those are going to be important when we, when we go through the calculation. Um, okay, so let's see. Here's the calculation. Uh, what do I do next? Yeah, okay, so here's the calculation. Actually, let me go back here. Okay, so this is the calculation we're going to do. We're going to say, all right, what do I really want to find? What I want to find um, is the digging velocity right here, the digging velocity of the, of the clam. Okay, so in order to get the digging velocity, the way, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a force balance. Okay, force balance. Um, so first of all, I'm going to um, ignore gravity for now. We can put gravity in later if we wanted to, but for now I don't really care if I'm digging up or down or sideways. Let's say it's digging sideways so gravity doesn't matter. Okay, so I'll ignore gravity. Um, I'm also going to assume this guy is going slow, so there's no inertia. So in the force balance, the only thing that you have is you have the drag on the upper cylinder and the lower, and the lower sphere. That's the only, the only forces you have. So you have to calculate drag somehow. Okay, so if I'm going to calculate drag, um, I need to know something about, A, the shape of these guys. Fine, that we're going to prescribe. I told you what that was on the previous slide. It's just two cylinders in a sphere. No, one cylinder in a sphere. Okay. So the shape is known, but I also need to know something now about the local material properties surrounding each of those guys. Okay, so that's going to be the hard part of the calculation is how do I figure out what is, the, uh, what is the change in the local properties around each of these guys. Okay, and for that, I need to calculate the void fraction around um, each of these objects as they shrink. Okay, so that is going to be the plan of attack. So the plan of attack is select the kinematics. Check, we've done that. I've told you I have just have growing and shrinking cylinders, growing and shrinking spheres. Now I'm going to calculate the void fraction in the grain surrounding it. Once I know the local void fraction or the local particle, particle density, whatever you want to call it, around that, um, I can calculate a constitutive relationship to get an effective kind of viscosity, which tells me something about drag. Then you just do the force balance, and then you get, get the, uh, the digging velocity. And it turns out that once you do this, the rest of this is easy. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on that one, and then everything else will fall out. OK, so here's the calculation. <clears throat> All right, so now the reason this is tricky is, uh, is as follows. So um, imagine that this clam was, instead of moving through a packed bed of grains, that it was moving through a, uh, a very a dense suspension, okay? 
So the difference between a packed bed of grains and a dense suspension is in a packed bed of grains, the, sands, the sand particles are all touching one another, <clears throat> and so they can transmit forces and they can support loads. In a sus suspension, all the particles are free to move. Okay, so imagine you're in a suspension where the particles are free to move. So if you're in a suspension where the particles are free to move, imagine now I have that lower sphere um, and it shrinks. So as it shrinks, it pulls fluids and fluid and particles in with it. Okay, as it pulls the fluid in, um, this fluid is an incompressible fluid. Okay, and since it's incompressible, that means I can't pile up mass anywhere in the system. Okay, so I generate whatever flow field it is, which is not piling up any mass. If I'm not piling up any mass, that means I can't pile up any particles which are being passively convected by the fluid. Okay? If I can't pile up any particles, that means that if I start with a uniform concentration of grains, I'm going to end with a uniform concentration of grains. And I don't get this nice bonus where I have this sort of little extra void around the, the sphere. Okay? Now, if you don't believe me, that is your first homework assignment, is to prove to yourself that that's really true if you are dealing with a dense suspension. Okay, now the good news is that in a, uh, in a, in a packed bed of, of grains, that's not what happens. So, I mean, you kind of know that if you reach in sand and you move your hand around, that you can loosen up, you can locally loosen up the grains, you can locally fluidize the grains. Okay, and the reason that happens um, is because uh, when you perturb something in the sand, um, what you actually get is you get a failure surface around the object that you've perturbed. And out here, nothing happens. So out here, you haven't disturbed any of the force chains. Everything is still ho holding up the way it always does. Okay? And it's only in here that you've sort of loosened everything up. Okay? So in this scenario, if this is true, then uh, these guys out here don't go, don't go in here, and these guys don't go out here. So there's no, there's no interchange of particles across this boundary. Okay, so everything out here is still stationary, hasn't done anything funny. But in here now, um, if this thing shrinks, since I have a fixed number of particles within this failed surface, um, the, the, uh, the density of these particles must go down, or the volume fraction must go down, because I've given it more volume. Everybody good with that? Okay, good. So the name of the game here now is to calculate where this failure surface occurs. Okay? Okay, so... Uh, so how do I know when things have failed in a granular media? Well, um, typically what you say is that if I have, let's say I have two grains, um, if I want them to fail, that means they have to slide past one another. Um, and the sort of typically you say, okay, I have to apply a, a minimum amount of shear stress in order to get these things to slip. Okay? And that amount of shear stress that I have to apply is proportional to the normal stresses that I'm applying, right? So if I really cram these together, then you have to push hard to make it slip, but if they're only sort of loosely in contact, then you don't have to push as hard, okay? And the simplest model um, is just that the, the required shear stress to make these things go is proportional to the normal stress. And there are many, many, many other, I mean, there's books that the soil community writes on this, right? So you can look up any constitutive model you want, but that's sort of the simplest one, and it works pretty well for sand. Um, okay, so that basically looks like this. So you say, okay, I have a shear stress here and I have a normal stress here, and the failure criteria is that my shear stress has to be, nor has to be larger than some, uh, some normal stress times some constant. So if you're up here, you've failed. If you're down here, you're still intact. Okay? Okay, so, so far so good. Um, so now all I have to do is I have to look everywhere inside this material, and I have to figure out where is this criteria satisfied and where is it not satisfied, right? And presumably, over here, things have failed, and out here, things have not failed. Okay. Now, there's one more uh, subtlety to this, um, and the subtlety is that stress is, of course, a tensor. Okay, so what the heck does it mean that the shear stress is bigger than the normal stress? So imagine the following. So imagine, um, okay, so imagine this is my granular material, and I look at a little, a little element in my granular material. So say I look at something like that. Okay, and um, so I've got some normal stress here. I'll call that sigma xx. Let me give you some coordinates. So let's say, actually, let's call that y. So let's say this is the x direction. This is the y direction. Okay, so this will be sigma yy. Right, and then I've got something here which is going to look like sigma xx. Okay, and let's say that's it. So you would say, ah, okay, well, um, there are no shear stresses in what I've drawn there. Everything is a normal stress, so it should be fine. It hasn't failed. Okay, and then someone comes along and says, ah, yes, but wait a minute. I actually prefer to work in this coordinate system. What if I could do this? 
That's my favorite coordinate system. So I'm now going to draw the same, the same square at the same point. Okay, and now um, I don't have any normal stresses. Everything is shared. It looks like this. Right, because I just took a linear combination of that and 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 that to make these, these guys over here. So this is going to be everything here is sigma xy. So now everything is shear and there's no, no, no normal stress. So this tells me that it should have failed at that point. Okay, so how do you decide which coordinate system to use? Is everybody clear with that? Does everybody like stress tensors? <laughs> okay, so this is, I'm about, actually I'm about to tell you something that will mean that you don't have to use a stress tensor for this, so I have good news coming. <laughs> okay, so, um, so depending on how you look at this, this would tell me that it hasn't failed, this would tell me it has failed, and I'm looking at the same point in the material. So the basic, so the rule that you use is you say, okay, um, I, say, I consider that that point has failed if my criteria is violated in any coordinate system. So as soon as something has been violated in what in, so I have to check all the possible coordinate systems, and if any one of them is broken, then the thing has failed. Okay? Now, of course, now that means that what our, the, the calculation we have is a serious pain in the neck, because now I have to check every point in my entire field in every possible coordinate system to see which one of them have violated the, the failure criteria. Okay, so the way you do that, um, I mean, so you could put it into a computer. That's the nice thing about this day and age. You just let the computer tell you the answer. Uh, but the other thing you can do is you can use a really nice trick called um, Mohr circle. Do you guys know Mohr circle? How many people have seen Mohr circle? Good, that's great. In the state, you don't learn, physicists never learn Mohr circle in the States. So that's wonderful. Okay, so um, uh, for those of you who have not seen Mohr circle, I'm about to show you something magical. <laughs> okay, and let me tell you this also. I have never seen anybody use Mohr circle in their research. But Amos, my student who was working on this, came to me and he was like, I used Mohr circle to solve the problem. <laughs> and it's exactly the right way to do it. Okay, so, so here's how Mohr circle works. Um, and I'm not going to go through it. In fact, I'm just going to copy some pieces of the calculation so that I don't have to go through all the algebra, because otherwise we're going to be here all night doing algebra. Um, but the basic idea is the following. So suppose, suppose, let's see, suppose I use the other side of this. Can I do that? No. OK, wait. Uh, hmm. Yeah, OK, I'll do it here. OK, so suppose I've got, um, I have some coordinate system, x and y, and I look at some little element in my material, OK? And I can label all of my stresses on this guy. Right, so this is sigma xx. This is sigma yy. These guys are all going to be sigma xy. Right, so all of these shear stresses are sigma xy, that's sigma yy, sigma yy, sigma xx, sigma xx. Suppose this is known. Suppose I go into my system and I calculate or I measure so I know what this is. Okay, and then I say, okay, um, what I would like to do um, is I would like to know what do my stresses look like in this new coordinate system here. X prime, y prime, which is rotated from my previous one by some angle theta. Okay, so then I've got something like this. Okay, so here are my stresses in the new coordinate system. Again, a perfectly fine way to represent the stresses. Um, you just have to tip your head that way. Uh, so this is going to be sigma x prime, x prime. This is sigma y prime, y prime. And all of these shear stresses are sigma x prime, y prime. Okay, good. Now, um, I mean, everybody has transformed things before. Right, so you know that you you know deep in your heart that if you really had to do this, you could do it, right? And all you have to do is you have to do the right geometry. So you have to do this. So you have to put an angle in here. Then you have to do all the right geometry, and then you have to cut out the right chunk, and then you have to balance these forces with those forces, and you have to put primes on one side and unprimes on the other side, and you come out with a long mess. But you can do it. Okay, so you can do it. Um, and so I'm going to tell you what the answer is, um, and I would like to really do it on the other side of this board. But first, I have to. Do I, do I undo this? Yeah. Okay. Oh, perfect. I really am an engineer. I promise. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So if you go through all of that pain and you do the transformation, this is the equation that you come up with. Okay. And I'm just going to write. I'm not going to go again. I'm not going to go through all the algebra. I just want you to see what where the points are along along this trans this these steps. Okay. So I get a sigma x prime x prime. Uh, by the way, am I writing big enough? Can you guys see this back there? Yeah, okay. 
No? Bigger? Oh, okay, I'm all right, bigger. Wait. Okay, so, uh, okay, that was the same size. <laughs> so sigma x prime x prime uh, minus sigma x x uh, plus sigma y y over 2 um, is equal to sigma x x. And again, you can look this up in, you know, in any standard textbook, right, um, over 2 times cosine 2 theta. So remember, theta was the angle that we rotated by, um, plus sigma xy sine 2 theta. Okay, so that's one equation that you get. Um, so that's balancing forces in the x direction, I think, or maybe it's the y direction, I'm not sure. And then you balance in the other direction, and you get um, uh, sigma x prime x prime. Um, and honestly, it would be worth checking these because, you, you know, I wrote, I wrote this down on this thing I found in my hotel room. So, you know, maybe all my primes are in the right spot, but it's worth checking. Okay, so sigma yy uh, over 2 sine 2 theta plus sigma xy cosine 2 theta. Okay, so it's a mess, but fine. Okay, now here's where the magic happens. The next thing you do is you square both of these equations and you add them together. Okay, and if you square them and add them together and rearrange, uh, you end up with the following. Okay, so what you end up with is sigma x prime, x prime, and by the way, we're almost done with this calculation now. Uh, sigma xx plus sigma yy over 2, this whole quantity squared, um, plus uh, sigma x prime y prime squared um, is equal to sigma xx minus sigma yy over 2 squared plus sigma xy squared. Have you found an error in my algebra? It's very possible that there could be one. This, I guarantee that this equation is right. These two you'll have to check. <laughs> Yeah, they're different. Yep. So when you when you square them and add them together, you get a you get a sine squared two theta with this and a cosine squared. So okay, so those two combine to get a one out of this. So you can get rid of all of your angles if you do that. Good. And like I said, I guarantee this one. Those you have to check. Okay. Now, now here's where things get interesting. So let's think about what do we know and what do we not know. So remember on the previous page I said, suppose we know everything in the x and the y coordinate system, and we're trying to find out what's going on in the, in the primed coordinate system. Okay, so this is known. This is just a number, right? Because I measured those at the x and the y coordinate system. Okay, and so I'm just gonna give this a name. Uh, I'm gonna call this r squared. Okay, this is known. This is just a number, because I measured those in the x and y coordinate system. So, and in fact, what is it? It's the average of the, of the normal stress in the x direction and the normal stress in the y direction, okay? So I'm just gonna call this sigma bar because that looks like an average stress, okay? And, uh, and now I'm gonna give these two guys names. So this guy here, uh, I'm gonna call uh, sigma n because I'm gonna say that's the normal stress in the primed coordinate system. And this guy here, I'm gonna call tau because that's the shear stress in the, in the prime coordinate system. Okay, so known, known, and what I want to know is the normal stress and the shear stress in the prime coordinate system. Okay, so now look at my fabulous equation. So the fabulous equation is now sigma n um, minus sigma bar squared plus tau is equal to r squared. Okay, this tau squared. That's even better. <laughs> this is now the equation for a circle in the sigma n tau, tau plane. Okay, so here it is. So here if I plot now tau on this axis, sigma n on this axis, okay, it is a circle um, which is centered on tau is equal to zero and sigma n is at sigma bar. So let's call this distance here sigma bar. 
and draw a circle. Okay, and this distance here is sigma bar. Okay, so now this is why this is so great, right? Because if I've measured this in one coordinate system, the x and the y coordinate system, I know the average stress, right? I know r. And so any in any other coordinate system, my pair of my normal and shear stress has to sit somewhere on this circle. It's the only way it can go. Okay? So for example, let's suppose in my, uh, in my xy coordinate system, the original coordinate system, I said uh, this, is the, this is the stress. Oh, let, me, let me draw it this way. Uh, let's see. So if I do this. Okay, so if I draw it this way, let's say that this, this point here represents the stress on this face, right? So on that face, I have a normal stress and I have a shear stress. Well, here it is. This, it's the normal stress and the shear stress on that face. Okay, this guy here, this is the normal stress and the shear stress on that face. Okay, now if I change coordinate systems, um, all I do is I rotate this around the Mohr circle. In fact, if I change coordinate systems by theta, so if I remember I rotated my coordinate system by theta, this guy goes over here. This angle is now, you rotate by 2 theta. And this guy here, again, you rotate by 2 theta. And that's, that's your stress in the new system, coordinate system. Okay? Now, why is this useful? So remember, why were we doing all of this? So for, first of all, this is actually just a really beautiful way to represent stresses. Okay. I mean, so that, that's number one. Okay, but if you actually want to use it for something useful, let's think about what this does in the context of the clam. So what did I need to do? I said, if this failure criterion is satisfied in any coordinate system, then the surface has failed. Okay, so the clam looks like this. So the clam, here's a clam. Let's say my clam is a cylinder. It's sitting in here. Um, and I want to look somewhere out here and ask, what is the state of stress out here? Well, OK, so I can easily write down the state of stress in some nice xy coordinate system. I can say there's some vertical, uh, there's some vertical load here, which is basically just hydrostatics, right? because there's just some load up here. And then there's some horizontal state of stress, which I'll tell you about how we can calculate in a minute. OK, um, and so, so this is known, and this is known so I can draw a Mohr circle. OK, so here's a Mohr circle right there. OK, so this is, my, this is my vertical state of stress. This is my horizontal state of stress. And then I just drew a circle through it. Okay. Now, if I go over here, if I take this and I start to move this way, and I draw another patch here, I draw another patch here, as I go this way, the vertical stress doesn't change because it's still just hydrostatic. Right? So I'm just moving along this way, doo -doo -doo, um, which means that this point here doesn't move. Right? That's the thing that represents the vertical stress. Okay, so that just sits there. But if my clam has collapsed, that means that I've got sort of a low pressure region over here, which means that the horizontal stress is going down as I move this way. Okay, so if the horizontal stress is moving down as I go that way, that means that this point starts to move this way. Okay, so it means my, as I go towards the clam, my Mohr circle does something like this until it hits the failure criterion. Okay, and so now to calculate when the thing has failed, it is purely a geometric problem, and you just have to figure out when does that circle hit that line, which is now an easy problem. You don't have to do any coordinate transformations. So all of that, you don't even have to do that to solve this problem. right? That was just to set up the Mohr circle. So you, now you've seen it once, you never have to do it again. You now know what Mohr circle is. Okay. So you can now figure out, just through geometry, um, when does that thing hit the line. When that thing hits the line, that's the radius at which this fails. And now you know where your, where your surface has failed. Everybody good with that? Everybody believe that? Kind of. OK, so let me tell you. Let me now tell you um, what, what, what you actually get when you plug that in. Um, let's see. Well, let's just, uh, let me just do it over here. Uh, boy, what I really need is a paper towel to erase this, but let's see if I've got some space on the other side. I'll make space. OK. So, OK. Oh, perfect. Oh, perfect. Wow, you guys are great. <laughs> okay, so let me just get some space here. Ask and ye shall receive. Okay, so everybody's absorbing more circles. So, 
Okay, so the um, so the geometric criterion that gives you when that thing uh, when that thing crosses is basically this. Uh, so it's sigma v sigma v prime um, is equal to uh, one plus sine theta, and this is an easy thing to check, right? So you can you can do a little bit of geometry to see where this comes from. Uh, sine theta times sigma h prime. Okay, and that's just saying so sigma v prime is this guy, sigma h prime is this guy, and theta is the angle that this makes with the horizontal. Okay, so that's the geometric criterion that says when that is satisfied, then this thing has, then the circle has touched the line. Okay, so um, so now to go back in the language of the clam, I need to know what is the vertical uh, the vertical stress and what is the horizontal stress. Okay, uh, well, so I told you um, that the vertical stress, sigma v, um, is basically just hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so hydrostatic pressure is just rho g h, rho g h, let's call it rho g z for however deep my clam is, okay? Um, it turns out that if you're in soil, there's a small correction you have to add to this, so it's not exactly like it is in fluid, and the small correction um, is rho fluid, so this is the density of the fluid, so this is a saturated soil, so I have particles and water like you saw in the movie with the clam, uh, g z. Uh, this is called the pore pressure, Okay, and this comes about because there's little lubricating layers of fluid between all of your grains. So there's a small correction that comes in, comes in through the pore pressure. Um, okay, so that's this. So I plug that in there. Okay, sigma h. So what is my horizontal stress? Well, so my horizontal stress, I basically have to solve the following problem. I have to say, okay, suppose I have um, a cylinder. Okay, and when and the clam collapses, leaving a void that has some pressure, let's call it P naught, out here. Okay, and then I have some material, what elastic, plastic, whatever you want out here, and then I have some boundary condition at infinity where uh, the stress is known at infinity. Okay, so I basically have to solve for um, you know whatever the stress field is in here, and you can look this up in Landau and Lifshitz, or you can look this up in any book on elasticity or, or solids, right? And this is a standard problem. So this is um, this is basically axisymmetric. You have boundary condition here. You have a boundary condition there, um, and the answer is this. Okay, so the answer is r squared over r squared times p naught minus sigma infinity, right? So there are the boundary conditions um, plus sigma infinity. Okay, so that's the answer you'll get in any standard book, and then you have to add again the pore pressure. Good? Okay, and R, big R, is the radius of the clam. Okay, so that tells you that um, basically the way you go, so I have some pressure here, P naught, and some stress here, sigma infinity, pressure and, and stress both have the same units, so I'm sort of going from P naught to sigma infinity, and you can see that it dies off like uh, 1 over R squared, right? So R squared is the distance from the clamp. Okay, so, and that's it. That's all you need. So you plug this in here, you plug this in here, and, uh, and you solve for R. And that's where the failure surface is. Okay, so let me just tell you what it looks like. Um, here is what it looks like. Um, let's see. Let me go over here. So um, R, failure, normalized by the radius of the clam, um, is equal to some constant. So again, there's a lot of algebra, so you have to collect your constants. But fine, that's a, a constant which has material properties in it, times some other constant that you can measure, um, plus rho f is the density of the fluid, divided by phi, that's the, the, the packed volume fraction. Delta rho is the density difference between the particles and the fluid, times 1 minus p naught over rho fluid gz to the 1 half. Okay, so you get this pretty nice, simple expression. But even nicer is as you go deeper, so notice z is the depth, right? Z came from that hydrostatic piece right here. So z is the depth. So as you go deeper and deeper, uh, this piece becomes very small. Okay, so for large z, so this is as the clam goes down, eventually you get to something where your failure surface looks like this, uh, is equal to c naught times 
k naught plus rho f over uh, rho, oops, sigma delta rho to the one half. Okay, so as it's going down, um, basically it's it's bringing down sort of this cylinder of failed material as it goes down. Yes. The pore pressure also acts in the horizontal direction. The, the, horizontal direction. And the, the reason for that is that the, um, so the, um, so the, the pore pressure is basically the thing that's sort of allowing these, these grains to slide relative to one another, right? So it basically acts and it helps in any, in any direction, right? So it's basically something that it, that helps in, with, it, with any stress field, yeah. Ah, yes. Ah, good, great question. Yes. Yeah, so, so it could it could induce capillary forces, except um, in this problem we're assuming no interface. So we're assuming that it's completely submerged. Once you introduce capillary forces, all bets are off. You have it's totally different calculation, which is an even harder and more interesting yeah. calculation. <laughs> great. Good. <laughs> Other questions. Uh, should be negative on both. Ne negative and negative. Wait, did, did I, do I have it wrong somewhere? Sigma V. Sigma V. Sigma v. This one here? Yes, yes exactly. It's a, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so this is. So this row is the total. Row total. So this row is the density of the fluid grain mixture. Oh, because uh, so this one. So let's see. So let me see. So if I've got, yeah, this is good. Okay, so if I've got all of these grains, okay, so, um, so on the one hand, I have this which is pushing down, which is giving me a high pressure down here, right? And this is actually, this is helping because the fluid is carrying some of that weight. Yeah. So that's why that's negative. Yeah, good. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Say again? The row F, the pore pressure is due to the clamp. If there was no clamp, it would... Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, so, no, so rho F is actually due to the fluid. Yeah, so this is, okay, so this is actually, this is great. Okay, so suppose, so this is all fluid in here. There are no interfaces, so this thing is totally submerged. Okay, so this is fluid. Okay, and this is, uh, so this is something that you find in a soil mechanics textbook, which is, which is something that I, I didn't even know there was a field of soil mechanics until I started doing this. Okay, but there is. And so, um, so typically, in, if you look at um, sort of, the papers written by the physics community on granular materials, um, you're, they're typically looking at dry grains. So you're only looking at the forces that are supported by the dry grains. And in fact, in that case, this can become very complicated because you can have stress chains that go through there so the, for, the, the forces can be distributed in weird ways. You don't necessarily get a hydrostatic distribution, right? Okay, but in the, when you're talking about engineering and soil mechanics, um, typically it's pretty good to treat, the, to treat these soils as a hydrostatic medium, okay? And if I look at, let's say I look at this guy down here. Without the fluid, this guy would be carrying the weight of all of these guys above it. But with the fluid, um, you actually get some help from the fluid because the fluid here, it, there's a tiny lubricating layer between here, so it's hard to squeeze this, this fluid out. So the fluid is carrying some of that load. So it's the fact that there's a fluid between the grains, not the fact that there's the clam there that you get that, that, um, the pore pressure. That makes sense. Good. Good. Yeah, this is actually an interesting problem. I mean, there's there's a nice problem here calculating the, and, and you know, and again, I think this is fairly empirical the way this was derived. But you should be able to derive it using a lubrication approximation between these grains. So I haven't done that calculation before. Good. Okay, that's great. Okay, so, uh, so this is the answer. This is where the, the, the thing fails. And if you put in numbers for, um, uh, uh, so we built a, a little mechanical clam, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But if you put in numbers and you put the mechanical clam um, in glass beads, um, you expect this to be something uh, on the order of 3.3, 3, uh, 3 .3, right? So 3 point, the failure rate should be 3.3 3, uh, radii away from the clam, okay, for glass beads. Okay, so we can measure that. So we did. 
So uh, if you measure that, um, so this is a system, this is not our system, this is by uh, a system by Wolfgang Lussert at University of Maryland. It's, this is actually a beautiful setup. So it's glass beads um, in a fluid that's been uh, index matched, so you can look through everything. And then you put a, shine a laser sheet through to, and, uh, and do PIV on the beads that are illuminated with the laser sheet. Um, so we built a little mechanical clam, which I'm going to tell you about in a little bit, um, and put it in there to measure where that failure radius occurs. Um, and here's the plot. Uh, this is actually a hard to understand plot, so let me describe what it is. So um, this here is the, is the average strain that you see um, in, the, in, part, in the particles. This axis here is the, um, the distance away from the clam. So this is one clam radius away, this is two clam radii away, this is three, this is four, this is five. And the series here is time. Okay, so initially nothing happens, then these guys in the blue and green move, and then they kind of settle back down to some other state. Over here, if you're very far away from the clam, nothing happens, right? So as you go in time, uh, the strain doesn't change. Okay, now the interesting thing about this, difficult to read plot, um, is that right over here, so you pretty much see everything move. So here's, here's where stuff has failed, here's where stuff has not failed. Um, the point, the crossover point between failed and not failed is right between 3 and 4, which is exactly what we calculated over there, that it should be 3.3. .3. So within the resolution of our, of our measurement, um, that seems to be consistent with what, we, with what we observe in the experiment. Okay, that was the hard part. The rest of it is now easy. Okay, so I now know where the failure surface is. Okay, um, because I know where the failure surface is, um, I know how many particles were originally in here before this thing starts, started to collapse. Once this thing collapses, um, I, I know how many particles there are because it's the same number as it was before, um, but I know the volume has changed, and I know how much the volume has changed because I know how much this thing shrunk. Okay, so I now know what the new volume fraction of particles is, is in here. Okay, and now I have to pick some kind of a constitutive relationship that relates volume fraction of particles um, to uh, something like an effective viscosity. Okay, this is something also you can go, you know, if you, if you look in the literature, you're going to find a thousand, well, not a thousand, you'll find tens if not hundreds of these. Okay, so um, probably the most common one um, is something called a Krieger-Doherty relation. Does anybody, anybody know Krieger-Doherty? Krie yeah, okay, krieger Oh, good, we have some particle people. Okay, so Krieger-Doherty, so Krieger-Doherty basically says the following. It says that um, mu, the effective viscosity um, of your medium, which is now filled with particles, and you have a particle volume fraction over here, um, at some point it blows up, so you have some, something that looks like that. So that's your viscosity as a function of your volume fraction of particles. Okay, um, we're not going to do anything this complicated because we're talking about moving small amounts of, of particles, so we're going to say, all right, suppose I'm somewhere over here, I'm just going to look at what happened, I'm going to make a linear approximation and ask, okay, what happens sort of in that region around my initial state. So we just did a Taylor expansion. You could put in this, this uh, something like this. I don't think it's going to change the results very much. Um, so if you put that in, I mean, quantitatively you'll get different numbers, but to understand the physics, you, you don't really get, get any, gain anything. Um, okay, so, uh, so here's my linear expansion. So this is, this is the, um, the effective viscosity in the unperturbed state. And now I perturb it a little. So this is my change in volume fraction, which happens when I shrink my sphere. Um, and then there's some coefficient in front which is a number which you measure, okay? So it's a measure, it tells you how much, if I change my volume fraction by this much, how much does my viscosity change, okay? And I, I do this around the sphere, so this is what I do around the sphere, and I do this around the cylinder, okay? Okay, um, and then, and now the rest is just algebra, okay? So uh, again, the force balance, the force balance is just the, uh, the drag on the, oh, I used S for shell and F for foot. So the drag on the shell and the drag on the foot. So this is the drag, this is again, all, everything is basically low Reynolds number, so the drag is proportional to the velocity. This is the velocity of the shell, velocity of the foot. Um, I know all of the geometric parameters because I prescribed those. I now know these viscosities because I just calculated those on the previous two slides from my change in volume fraction. Um, and I know equilibrium says this has to be true. Right? The forces have to balance. Okay. And now I have everything. So I plug this in here. I plug in my viscosities from the previous page. I do a whole bunch of algebra. And in the end, what I get is I get something that looks like this. Um, and now I can just average the, the velocity over one cycle to find out what is the average digging speed. I told you it got much easier after you got this. We just finished it. <laughs> OK, so now let's interpret what does that result mean. 
Okay, so, um, so if I, once I do the averaging, this is what I get. So I've now rewritten it a little bit. Um, this beta is the aspect ratio of the shell. Okay, so, um, so uh, let's see. So big betas are, um, big betas are short fat shells. Uh, little betas are long skinny shells. Okay. Um, deltas, these deltas, and I've written it now again to split this up into the physics that we talked about originally. Because remember I told you there's two ways you can actually dig. You can dig by, um, by uh, applying non-reciprocal kinematics, right? That was the push me pull you. Or you can dig by changing the material properties. Or you can do some combination of the two of them. Okay, and that's exactly what comes out of the calculation that we just did. You can split it up. This is the piece that comes from changing the material properties. This is the piece that comes from the, from the non-reciprocal kinematics. Each of those has a, little co has a little coefficient in front of it. This is the coefficient that comes from whatever you measure in your viscosity relationship. Right? So remember I had a d mu d epsilon, which tells you how much does your viscosity change when you change your volume fraction. That's this guy over here. This um, t depends on how much you blow up the foot. Right? So this tells you something about how, you know, how, how much did I, did I change my shape. OK. So now, here's the interesting thing here. If I plot these two functions now that I know, okay, so this, this guy here, I just plotted this function as a function of beta on the bottom. I didn't label it, but that's beta on the bottom, okay, and this as a function of beta on the bottom. Notice if I want to maximize my velocity, okay, so if I'm a clam, when do I dig? I dig because I'm threatened. It's a defense response, so you poke the clam and they go. So you want to get away from your predator. You want to dig as fast as you can. So you want to maximize your velocity, which means you want to sit somewhere over here where these maximum peaks are. Okay? And if I'm a clam, I'm going to take some linear combination of these guys, depending on how much my material properties help me and how much my kinematics help me. Okay? So for example, here is, so here's a linear combination of the two of them. Okay? Um, no matter what I choose for these two guys, no matter what I choose, the maximum is always somewhere between one six and two thirds, always. Okay. Okay. So here's my digging velocity. So now the next thing you can ask is, well, okay. Um, so what are the ratios of real clamshells? Okay. And uh, and again, we were thinking about the razor clam, so we got data for the razor clam. It turns out there are two kinds of razor clams. There's an Atlantic razor clam and a Pacific razor clam. Okay. So here is. Um, the Atlantic razor clam. So the Atlantic razor clam has an aspect ratio of about 1 6. So it's right on the edge of that box. The Pacific razor clam has an aspect ratio of about, uh, of about whatever that is, <laughs> 1 4. <fourth. laughs> okay. So it's somewhere in the middle of that box. Okay. Now, so first of all, it's great news that the clams are within the box, so that's good. Now, and, and it's actually kind of surprising considering all the uh, approximations we made along the way. Um, but the other interesting thing is that um, judging from this plot, you would expect the Atlantic razor clam to rely more heavily on the material properties of the soil, right? Because the material properties should push you, if you're, if you're gaining a lot from material properties, you should move this way, whereas if you're, uh, if you're relying on kinematic, kinematics, you should move this way. Okay. And it turns out that if you look at the environments that these, that these dig in, the, razor, the Atlantic razor clams are, in fact, the ones that dig through these really mucky environments where you can get a huge change in material properties as, as, they, as they dig. These actually these live in some, some pretty nice sand, right? So you kind of, you know, I mean, you can kind of loosen things up a little bit. But these, you can actually make a big difference if you stir things around. So, uh, so that's also consistent with, uh, with the way we've sort of we've split this up. OK, so that's, that's all I'm going I'm, I'm to say about the toy model, because that's sort of as far as you can push the toy model, I would say. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about live clams, and then we're going to take a break, because I know this is going to be otherwise very long. OK, questions on this? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah, so you repack. Uh, yeah, so you repack. So, um, so in fact, the toy model does take into account the repacking. Um, but what the toy model does, so basically the toy model says, and this is where there's a little bit of a cheat in the toy model. <laughs> there's a lot of cheats in the toy model, but this is an important one. Okay. The toy model says, well, in my initial state, I sit somewhere around here. So this is what I call packed, which is not really packed if you think about a krieger dorney relationship. And then I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move back and forth along this line so I can get a little bit more packed and a little bit less packed. Right. So in reality, you know, the clam is actually sitting on this side of the line. 
in, in the pack bed. So you have to do something. You have to do something more complicated with your constitutive relationship to really get it right. Um, and I think that this is this is one place where you really where the where you really could get improvements in the model if you pick the right constitutive relationship. Yeah, very good. Anything else? Good. Okay, let me show you how clams dig. Okay, so the other thing that uh, Amos did. So first, okay, so first of all, uh, we had to get clams. It turns out you're not allowed to just go and get clams in Massachusetts um, because people make their living collecting clams. So you have to get a clam digging license. So uh, Amos went and got his, he got trained as a clam digger and got his clam digging license. He's the only, as far as I know, uh, researcher who is a licensed clam digger in the state of Massachusetts. Okay, and he's allowed to collect like 12 clams a year or something like that. So he did that. And, uh, and then he came back and he built, uh, he built basically a clam Healy Shaw tank. So the clam Healy Shaw tank is it's two plates of glass. And you put glass beads in it and, and water, and then you shine a light through the back, and you put your clam in the top, and you watch it dig. Okay? So here's what he saw in the clam Healy Shaw tank. This is now sped up by a factor of 10. This is the clam, uh, this is the clam shell lying across the top here, and it's about, it's about this big. Okay? okay, so here you go. This is what a digging clam looks like. That's the foot that comes out. So, and this part, of, this part is very bizarre because it's trying to write its shell. Okay? And then, as you see, it doesn't go in smoothly. It goes in in these little hops, sort of like you'd expect, right? Because it's supposed to be ratcheting. OK, so the, so the clams do that. We have lots of data for digging clams. And we can look at how the, the grains move around the clam. And we can look at how the thing unpacks and all of these kinds of great things. Um, but then Amos did what I think is one of the, the greatest and easiest experiments we've done in the lab, uh, which is he said the following. He said, OK. What if we want to know how much force does a clam really, clam's muscles really have to exert to be able to dig into uh, the sand? Okay? So uh, he made um, what he calls his clamsicle. And the clamsicle is a clam shell that he's glued on a stick. Okay? And you take the clamsicle and you just push it into a bucket of sand and you measure how much force it takes. That's how much force it should take to pull your clam shell into, into sand. Okay? And this is what he measures. So if he takes his clamsicle and he pushes it into glass beads, he gets this line. And if he pushes it into the mud flat, which is the clam's native habitat, he gets this line. Okay? And uh, there's nothing surprising about either of these. You can see they're basically, you go linear with depth, which is you know, something that everybody sort of intuitively knows, that if you have something, you're pushing it into the ground, it gets harder the deeper you go. Fine. Everybody knows that. Uh, people who study granular materials also know that it should go linearly. So fine. Good. Now, the interesting thing came when he now asked, OK, well, how does this compare to a clam's muscle? OK, so uh, this is the other thing that you learn when you start to do these projects, is that biologists have measured everything. Everything that could possibly be measured, they've measured, and including how much force a clam's muscle can exert. OK, so they know this. <laughs> okay, so a clam's muscle, um, it turns out, can exert um, about 10 newtons of force. OK, so it's something like this. OK, so if a clam's muscle can exert 10 newtons of force, that means a clam should be able to dig down to about 10 centimeters, right? Because otherwise, you can't pull the, because the clam's muscle is the only thing that's pulling that shell through the sand, and you can't pull any harder than 10 newtons, so that's as deep as you should be able to go. Okay. It turns out that these clams actually uh, dig down to about a meter. Okay, so the question is, how on earth do they manage to dig down to a meter? And we already know the answer because we did the calculation over here, which is that, that you get, have some gain by wiggling around and loosening up the soil around the foot. Okay, um, okay so, uh, so how much do you gain? All right, so here's the, here's the basic scaling. Um, so first of all, okay, so the energy requ required to dig. So energy is force times depth. Good, fine, we all know that. Um, so if I'm going through a packed bed, so if I'm going through a packed granular system, um, the force, I just showed you the force required to push that clamsicle down uh, is linear with depth. You can make arguments about what these coefficients should be, but basically you just need to know it's linear with depth, which means that the energy to dig down to a certain depth should go like depth squared, okay? Because energy is force times depth. Fine, okay? Now, if I'm going through a fluid, so let's say I wiggle around, so I wiggle around and I fluidize something around me, okay? So this fluidized region now behaves like a very viscous fluid, okay? Um, it costs me energy to do this wiggling, but I, I'm now, I've now, again, changed my environment. Um, so if I'm moving through a fluid environment, uh, it's depth independent, right? This, this might be a very big coefficient, this viscosity out front, but it's basically depth independent, which means that the energy should scale linearly with depth. Okay, so now we have two things that we can test. You can measure to see whether or not you're going through a packed or fluidized environment just by measuring the energy you've expended. So, uh, so we did that. 
Okay, so here it is. So this is the clamsicle, um, which is exactly the data I showed you before. So this is the energy required to, uh, the energy expended. This is the depth. Um, and not surprisingly, it goes like, uh, uh, en uh, the energy goes like depth squared because, you know, the force went like depth. Fine. Okay. So now the question is, how much energy do real clams expend when they dig? Um, and it turns out that this is actually the one number that biologists can't measure. Okay, and the reason they can't measure it is normally to, to understand how much energy an organism has expended, um, what they do is they, um, they put them on a little treadmill and then give them a little mask to measure how much CO2 they're breathing out, basically. And they've done this with everything. I mean, really, like cockroaches and frogs. and I mean, anything you can put on a treadmill, they've put on a treadmill and they've measured the energy. Okay. But you can't do this on a clam because you can't put a clam on a treadmill. Okay, so the question is, how do you figure out how much energy the clam has expended? And the one thing they do know is they do know the energy ex uh, associated with every step, right? Because they know how much energy the muscles exert when they pull. They know how much energy is stored in the spring. They know the pressures inside the foot. They know the pressures inside the shell. All of those things have been measured. So if you put those together, you can calculate how much energy it takes the clam to dig. Um, so basically, those are all the steps. So this is closing the shell. This is the energy in the hinge. This is pulling the shell through the right. So, so it's all in there. Um, and you plot it, and you get this. And it's exactly linear, right? So this is the best you could possibly do, right? So this tells you that the clam is basically moving through a fluidized environment. Um, and you can even see um, where, you're, where you're burning energy and what the gain is, right? So here are the different steps. So steps is, are over here. So um, let's see. So how does this? Uh, so this is. Um, uh, okay, so this is, um, you, uh, you push your foot in, so you push the foot in, and so when you push the foot in, you actually back up a little bit, right? So in fact, you're going in the wrong direction. So here, this is bad, right? Because I just, I just used up energy to go in a bad direction, okay? Then over here, I close my shell. So I close my shell, I've now used up energy, but it hasn't gotten me, moved me forward at all. But because I did this little prep work over here, I can now take a giant step forward. Right? So this is where you pull, this is where you pull the shell down. Right? So again, I put the foot in, so use up a lot of energy, but don't make any forward progress. Close the shell, don't make any forward progress, but then I can take a big step forward going through that fluidized region. Good? Okay, so the moral of the story is yes, it costs you energy to do all of this extra stuff, but you win big in the end, especially if you're gonna dig deep. Right? Because if you're gonna dig deep, you're always gonna want this this one power instead of the two power. Okay, so now, uh, so now that we've done this, we say, okay, now we understand the energetics, which means I can now build a mechanical digger. Okay, so here's the mechanical digger. Uh, the mechanical digger is RoboClam. There's RoboClam. Um, RoboClam comes in three different sizes. That's the small size. Okay, uh, so RoboClam is actually, it's powered by uh, pneumatics. So the reason it's powered, so by compressed air. And the reason we power it by compressed air is because Amos wanted to take this to dig at the beach in the, in the clam's native habitat. And if you're going to be wading around in salt water, you don't want to be carrying around a giant power supply. So he said, okay, we're going to do pneumatics. So it's all compressed air. Um, when you put RoboClam on that setup, it looks like this. So this is the real RoboClam. So this is, this is the clam right here that he's got in his hand. And this is all the setup that goes with it to drive it. Okay. So, uh, so you do this. Um, and then we said, okay, so now what we want to do is we want to train RoboClam to dig with that same energy signature that I showed you on the previous page that you see in the real clams. Okay, so I want, I want a linear scaling of energy with depth, which is asking a lot because digging is not easy. Okay? And the other thing is we can't just cap copy the kinematics of the real clam because RoboClam is not exactly like the real clam. The densities are different, right? It's basically the same size, it kind of basically the same, but it's made out of different materials, right? You have to change, you have, which changes the inertia, which changes the speed. So it's not at all obvious how you should actu activate this. So we did the following. We said, okay, uh, let's just choose some kinematics, take a guess, okay? let it dig, so you put it in a tank, you let it dig through a bunch of sand, you measure the energy consumption, okay? and then you feed that into a giant optimization loop, and you keep start cycling through until the thing has learned how to dig with a linear power law. Okay? So when we did this, um, my, again, my graduate student Amos, he came to me and he said, you know what? Um, I really don't have time to do this. I think we should hire an undergraduate. And I said, you are crazy. <laughs> there, is, there is no way an undergraduate is going to be able to do this. Because you have to first you have to write the optimization code, then you have to connect it to the to the clan, then you have to control the clan, then you have to go through, then you have to search all this space. Optimization is not easy, you get trapped in these local mi minima. It's just it's all it's a nightmare. Okay. And he said, he said, 
well, just let me try it. I'm like, okay, fine. You have, you get two weeks, and after that, if I have an undergraduate crying in my office, we're cutting this off. Okay, so he comes back and he says, okay, I've got this great undergraduate, Robin Dietz. Robin had this thing working in two weeks. It was mind-blowing, okay, and this is what he did. So he, uh, so he said, okay, I'm going to use a genetic algorithm. Have you guys used genetic algorithms before? These can be very useful for the right type of optimization problem. And optimization is always tricky because the, you know, the right method you should use depends on the problem. Um, but in this case, we found something that worked extremely well with a genetic algorithm, um, and it works as follows. So um, basically, um, you imagine you have a population of competing organisms. Okay? And an organism, in this case, uh, is basically a set of parameters that is used by the robot. Okay? So organism one, for example, so let's say, okay, so let's say this is my sequence of digging, right? Um, something like this, okay? And this is, the, this is the set of commands I send to the robot. So I say, okay, first push up for this length of time with this pressure, then collapse in for this length of time with this pressure. Remember, this is all connected by pneumatics, so all you have to do is specify the, the pressure that, that comes from the gas cylinder and the time, okay? Then push down for this length of time with this cylinder, and then open out over this length of time with the cylinder. So basically, eight numbers. You send the robot eight numbers, and it knows what to do. Okay. So these eight numbers are one are one individual in my population. Okay. So what you do is you give the you give the computer something like ten individuals, random individuals. You give it ten sets of eight random numbers. Okay. Then it sends those numbers to the machine. It digs, measures energy. Sends in the next set, digs, measures the energy, digs, measures the energy. Okay. Then it looks at those 10 individuals and it throws out the bad ones and it breeds the remaining ones. So it starts to, it mixes up those things. And there's a little bit of mutation, right? Because you don't want to get trapped somewhere. So you, there's always a little bit of mutation every time around, which is why this is fiddly, because you have to decide how much mutation there is, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to fall out of your optimum if you're in there. Um, but Robin got it to work. And, uh, and what happens is you do the following. So, Here's an example. So here's a random initial condition. You can, we have millions of these, okay? And the signature that we're looking for is we want uh, the log of the energy um, to be linear, or we want the energy to be linear with the depth, right? So this should be linear with a slope of one, okay? And you can see that if you give it a random condition, you get garbage, exactly like who do, what you'd expect. It's garbage, it doesn't do anything. It flounders around over here for a little while and then something happened, maybe we bumped the barrel and then it floundered around up there for a little while, okay, so, so garbage, okay? So you basically gave it, give it 10 garbage diggers, okay? And then Robin goes home for the night. Then he goes home for the night, the clam does its thing overnight and he comes back in the morning and in the morning, it's doing this. Slope of one, it's amazing. It comes really close to the actual, to the, to the, to the theoretical maximum that you could actually achieve, okay? Um, so, um, so it works, the genetic algorithm was great. We have a clam that digs with basically the same efficiencies that a real clam does. Um, and, uh, and I'm just gonna show you, so, th so uh, that's Dan and Amos and Robin, and we're now gonna take a five minute break and then come back and switch gears. Okay, good, go. <laughs> Okay, so let's get started again. Okay, so now I'm gonna to totally switch gears. So this is now work that has, uh, this is new work that has not been published. So we have some answers and some answers we don't have. Um, and uh, and I, I wanna make sure that you guys have time for, to ask me questions. And, and I mean, you can, ask, you can ask about stuff I've talked about. You can talk, ask about other things in my research. You can talk, ask, how do I like MIT? Do I like to ski? I mean, you ask whatever you want, okay? So, um, so I'm gonna to try to do this in a half an hour so that we have, we have time to chat afterwards. Um, okay, and, uh, and this part is actually not about locomotion. So this part, uh, in the previous half of the talk, I talked about robots with granular materials outside of them, and now I'm gonna tell you about robots with granular materials inside of them. Okay, so, um, so let's see. So let me start um, by showing you uh, a movie which is, well, no, actually, first, do you guys know about jamming? Jam, okay, good, jamming. So, so jamming, so we have granular materials. There's this nice transition from flowing to jammed. And, okay, so you can go from solid-like to a liquid-like state. Fine. Um, and so um, Heinrich Jaeger and his group at Chicago had this great idea that you could actually use this in robotics. Okay, so they, they did the following thing. They made a gripper. Okay, and the gripper, so here's a picture of the gripper. So this is basically a, this is a balloon that's filled with sand. And you take it, so you take your balloon that's filled with sand and you just press it on something and then you pull a vacuum. And when you pull a vacuum, all of those, the grains jam and it picks up whatever it's, 
grabbing onto. Okay, and um, it's fantastic. So here is, let's see, is that movie running? Let's see, that'll go. Uh, so this is their universal gripper movie. So there it is, and it can pick up. So, so one of the challenging th things in robotics is picking up something like that is actually very complicated if you have fingers, right? Because you have to know where to grab it. You have to know how much pressure to, to apply. And here, everything, the mechanics does everything. So this is it. So you can pick up an egg, and um, it's fine. So it can pick up very delicate things. You know, I mean, robots can't pick up eggs, right? And now they will drop it for you to prove that it's a real egg. Right, see, so the egg crack. Okay, good. There you go. Yeah, okay. Um, so you can now pick up water for in, in one glass and you can pour it into another glass. Okay, and, and, the, and the controls are, are just dead simple, right? So nor, all of this would be incredibly complicated if you actually had to build a hand to do this. Okay, so, um, so they came up with this idea of doing these jamming robots. And um, if you, this is on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and look for uh, Chicago jamming gripper or something you can find the robot you can find the movie and it picks up all different kinds of things um, so uh, so after this um, there are a lot of people that started working on jamming robots um, including us and so we made a little a little trunk um, I'll let you look on on YouTube to see the writing so this is a trunk by uh, by my student Nadia Chang and now you have got three different um, segments um, oh I guess this will run it okay three different segments and you can, you can selectively jam them. So you basically have two cables that run down the side and if you switch off and on what's jammed then you can pick things up and you can have this thing take all different kinds of shapes. So it's, it's incredibly simple, right? It's just basically five segments filled with coffee. That's it. It's literally ground coffee in there, right? We used whatever we had lying around the lab. Um, okay, so, so we did this, um, but then we started, uh, um, we started to, to think a little bit um, sort of a little bit more along traditional robotics lines. Um, and we started collaborating with a company called Boston Dynamics. Okay, um, so has anybody heard of the company Boston Dynamics? Okay, has anybody heard of Big Dog? Big Dog, yes. Okay, so Big Dog. You can also go to YouTube and Google Big Dog. And you'll get a bunch of movies from Boston Dynamics. Let me show you one. Um, so this is, this is Big Dog. Uh, okay, so let's see if I can, I hope I'm still connected to the internet. Okay, so this is Big Dog. It's, it looks like two guys running, up and, uh, running in a dog suit. And, um, and the incredible thing about Big Dog, so robots normally cannot go over this kind of terrain, right? This is, this is extraordinary for a legged robot to be able to do what Big Dog is doing, provided my internet connection works, which hopefully it will in a minute. Uh, let's see, maybe I'm gonna try to reload this. Okay, so let me pause, because you have to get to the good part of this video. Uh, oh, I killed it. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is Big Dog um, running through the woods. Um, the other great thing, so has anybody ever done work on robotics in this group? Okay, so one, so one of the, there, there's a couple of key things that, to know. Um, most robots are tethered, meaning that they have a cable running to them for, to something else, and that cable carries uh, in general, power and controls. So your, your, so your power and controls are off board. Big Dog, you'll notice, has no tether. He can run around in the woods like this. Um, he's basically running, and in order to get the, the energy density needed to make something, oh, I should also say Big Dog is big. It's not the size, it's the size of a horse, not the size of a dog. <laughs> I mean, it's big. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So this is, this is, the, the, this is what sh shows you that these guys are the masters, right? I mean, there's nobody else on the planet that can write a control algorithm that will allow your robot to do that. Okay. So, um, and again, all of this, all of this is on board. So the controls are on board, the power's on board, everything. Okay. So, and, and you, again, go to YouTube, you'll find lots and lots of uh, movies about Big Dog. Okay. So, um, so we started collaborating with Boston Dynamics because uh, uh, I thought, okay, if I'm going to do robots, I better actually work with someone who knows how to build robots. And these are the guys who know how to build robots. Okay. Um, and so we, um, so the first thing we asked is that, um, well, uh, why is Big Dog so big? So you go and visit Boston Dynamics. They have this big warehouse, and they have these giant, terrifying robots that are running around, okay? And, uh, and you, yeah, and it, you know, it's amazing, totally amazing. This is ice, Big Dog on ice. Right, and this they did, I don't know, this movie was a couple years ago, so they now have even more sophisticated. <laughs> It's just it's incredible. Okay, so um, so the first thing we well actually I should let this I should let this run so you can see the rest of Big Dog. Uh, okay, actually I'll let, okay so I'm gonna let you guys 
again, go to YouTube and look for Big Dog. You've, you've now seen the, the cool part, which is the ice and the kick. Okay, so, let's see, so here's Big Dog. Okay, so we asked them, we said, well, um, why is Big Dog so big? And why are all of your robots so terrifyingly big? Uh, can't we build a little dog that we could have in our lab? Um, and the problem is that Big Dog uh, runs on hydraulics. So basically it has a hydraulic oil that runs through it, and there's a big pump in the middle that pushes this oil through into the limbs, which activates whatever actuator it has. So you don't have motors on each of the joints, right? If you had to do this with motors on each of the joints, it would be completely impossible. I mean, you just you can't do the control algorithm. So, so doing hydraulics allows them to do things that other people can't do with, with, um, with ro robots with motors. Um, so. We said, okay, can you, can you make a small dog? And they said, well, the problem is that you can't get the valves. So you need valves to control the flow. Um, and we went online to look up how much servo valves cost. And we said, okay, what if we made a little dog and we just, we're not even asking for micro scales, right? We're asking for a centimeter. Can I get a valve that's a centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter and put this in these, in these uh, things? And it turns out you can, but it will cost you $10,000 per valve. Right. which is not feasible. I mean, you cannot build, a, I mean, there's a lot of valves in this, so you cannot build a robot like this if it costs you $10,000 per valve. So we said, okay, um, well, what about this? So what if instead of valving the fluid, um, we use something called an electro-rheological fluid? So here's an ele electro, does, anybody, does everybody know what an electro-rheological fluid is? Yes, yes, some people, okay. So here's an electro-rheological fluid. So an electro-rheological fluid is basically a suspension of dielectric or paramagnetic particles. They're typically on the order of 10 microns. Um, that size is actually important because um, if you are smaller than a micron, then um, Brownian forces take over and you can never get the structures I'm about to show you and everything wiggles around. Um, if you're larger than 10 microns, then everything sets, the particles just settle out. So 10 microns is kind of, between one to 10 microns is sort of a magic size of, for particles in these suspensions. Um, and what you do is you apply a field Okay, so you apply a field. That field then induces a dipole moment on all of those particles. The dipoles now interact with each other, and dipoles like to line up, so they change the structure, and they make structures that look like this. Okay? And when they change that microstructure, they change the material properties by orders and orders of magnitude. So they'll change things like the yield stress and the viscosity of the fluid by something like five orders of magnitude. Okay, so, and to give you, uh, to give you um, an idea, this is, uh, this is data from Gareth McKinley's group. Um, this is a, uh, an, actually a magnetorheological fluid, so you apply a magnetic field, but it does exactly the same thing. Um, and so suppose, for example, this is shear stress on this axis. So suppose you're shearing it at some, uh, let's say at uh, 100, something like that. Okay, so the red curve is with the field off. So if you sh if you're have an application where you're shearing it at 100 or a couple hundred, you turn on the field and suddenly your viscosity goes from, what is this, uh, 10 up to 10 to the fifth, right? So you can really just flip a switch and change the viscosity. And you can do the same thing for the yield stress. Um, and for those of you who are not used to thinking about this uh, viscosity numbers, here's what that means. So you basically go from corn syrup to uh, window putty or something like that. So you're going from oil to peanut butter, okay? so. Um, so you can, do the, you can do all of this um, electrically now, uh, which means that you now have a valve. So all you have to do is instead of putting your normal hydraulic oil in your robot, you put an electro-rheological fluid in your robot, and you don't need valves anymore. You just need electrodes on all of your channels, and if you apply a voltage across them, these little chains form, you get a little blob of peanut butter in there so it stops the flow, which is effectively a valve. You turn it off, and the thing is completely reversible, and everything goes again. So, uh, so we decided to work with Boston Dynamics on this. Um, oh, this is telling you how much it costs, right? See, look, there's a valve for $10,000, okay? Um, and, uh, okay, so I have a postdoc who, um, uh, who decided to visualize these chains. Turns out it's somewhat non-trivial to visualize these in electro-rheological fluids. There's a lot of movies for magneto-rheological, but for the electrical, it's a little harder. Um, so basically, the, the experiment is, is like this. He has acrylic and he glues on a sheet of copper, and then he mills out a channel in the copper, and then he puts a plate of glass on here, and then you, and then you view it from above. So you pump your, you pump your fluid this way, um, and then you clip electrodes to your copper, and so when you clip electrodes to your copper, your electric field goes this way. Okay, so now you're looking perpendicular to your electric field, and, um, and you get something that looks like this. Okay, so this is the channel. This is about 200 microns. Now you turn on the field, and you get these nice chains that form. 
Okay, and they're nice and stable, and then at some point he's going to turn off the field. <clears throat> and I should say this is also um, very dilute because we needed that in order to be able to see through it. <coughs> so now the field is off. Um, and this is also slowed down, so this is milliseconds, the switching time. Okay, okay. So, um, so you can do a lot of things like that. Um, you can do a lot of different kinds of calculations. Um, maybe I'll do just one quick one. So, um, so one of the things that we'd like to do is we'd like to figure out what kinds of parameters um, in, their, in our channel makes for a good valve. Um, so let me just, let me just do the, 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 the common back of the envelope cal calculation. So suppose I have a channel. So let's say this is some width w and some height h. And this is the only calculation I'm going to do for this part of the talk. And some length l. And so I have fluid that's flowing down this thing. And I want to know, OK, if I apply an electric field across this, how much pressure can this thing hold? Right? That's really what you want to do when you're designing valves, is you want to know how much pressure can my valve hold back. Okay? So um, well, I can just do a force balance. So if I have some pressure on this side and some pressure on this side, that pressure is acting on this face. So I have some uh, delta P, that's my pressure drop across this channel, which is acting on this area, um, H times W. Okay? And if the valve is holding, that must be balanced by the yield stress in my material that I've now activated. Okay? So that has to be balanced by um, tau yield. Okay? And tau yield um, is determined by, uh, is acting on, all, on these faces over here. Right? So I've got a 2 times uh, WL plus 2 times HL. Because right? it's grabbing onto the walls, which is keeping it from moving. OK, so then that tells me, uh, let's see. So let me divide by uh, w. Uh, in fact, let me divide by 2wl. By 2wl. OK, and then um, let's divide by tau y. And cancel my w's. Cancel, 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 cancel. OK. Um, and, uh, and so I find that my dimensionless, the dimensionless pressure that I can hold back is delta P um, times H over 2 tau y L. Um, and that has to equal uh, 1 plus H over W. OK, so this is a dimensionless pressure. Okay, that tells me something about how much my valve can hold. Okay, and, um, and then this over here um, is the aspect ratio of the channel. Okay, so it tells you something about the aspect ratio of the channel. Um, and so I think that's, that should be the equation I have over here if I did it right. Delta P H 2 Y. Yes, good. I got it right. Okay, so, um, so if I plot my dimensionless uh, holding pressure versus the aspect ratio, um, I should get this curve right here. OK? Um, and we do get that curve, except we're off by a factor of 4, which is this curve. So if I just take this and multiply by 4, I get this. And these are all our experimental data points, which ignore the, the red crosses, which we've done something with roughness. The, the black dots are, are um, what's on there. OK, so, uh, so when this happened, uh, there, there were two things. Uh, we didn't initially pursue this, and for two reasons. One is that if you go in the literature, you find that a lot of people report this. They don't say why. They just say, oh, we're off by a factor of four or five, and it's higher. And so that's what you find in the literature. The second is that because we were doing this to build a robot, uh, we're actually doing better than we expected. So we weren't really going to complain, right? I mean, you're holding more pressure than you wanted to, so you could make smaller valves, which is great. Okay. But at some point, we decided, OK, actually, we really have to figure out what's going on here. Um, why, do you, why do you get this factor of four? And it turns out it's, it's very simple. And um, so I won't go through the, the details of the calculation, but uh, let me show you um, the visualization of the experiments. So here are the experiments that uh, my postdoc um, Chen did. So this is time on this axis. This is the channel. Okay. Um, and again, you're looking through the channel. The black lines are the chains. The white is um, area that you're seeing through. And um, so black is particles, white is no particles. And um, so what he did is he made a series of these in time. And then he took them. So for example, look at the one that's outlined in red. So you take that and you put it over here. 
and then you take the next one in time, and you put it over here, and you go, et cetera, et cetera, in time. You, make, you take all of your things in time, you line them up this way, um, and you get another plot that looks like this. OK, so does everybody understand this plot? So this now is distance into the channel. So my channel is going this way. This is time going this way. And so what you see is that there's this big black region that's growing at the, entry of the entrance of the channel. OK? OK, and that big black entrance actually solves this big mystery that's apparently been in the literature for many years. OK, the reason that you get, you get the extra holding pressure is that, um, and I'm going to skip the model, which is on this page, but we can model it and everything. The reason that we get the extra holding pressure is that when I did this back of the envelope calculation, um, one of the things in, in doing this calculation is this yield stress. Okay, so how do we get the yield stress? The yield stress we get by we take, the, we take the fluid, we bought the fluid from some company, we put that fluid in our rheometer, we measure the yield stress, and then we put that number in here. Okay? But if you look at that, if you think about that picture that I showed you before with that big black region at the entrance, you have all of these particles that are piling up. So the fluid that's actually at the entrance of that channel is not the fluid that came out of the bottle from the company. Right? You have a much higher concentration of particles. And higher concentration of particles increases your yield stress. Okay? So the, the only reason that, that you get this, over, this, this extra factor um, is because your particles build up uh, until you've hit the maximum number of particles. So what is the maximum number of particles that you can hold? Well, OK, so imagine this. Imagine you have a channel. OK, um, and I start pumping particles in, OK, and some of them start to stick. OK, so I get these clumps of particles that start to stick. OK, and then I have more particles that are coming in. There's some free particles like this. OK, so in order to ter determine whether a particle sticks, there's a balance of two forces, right? One is there's the electrostatic force that comes from the fact that I now have a dipole that's trying to attach to something, right? So the, so the electrostatic force wants it to stick. On the other hand, there's a shear force from the fluid which is trying to pull it through this stuff, okay? So the electrostatic force, well, I fixed the electric field, so that's kind of constant. The shear force, um, as these little structures build up, the fluid has less space to go, which means it has to go faster to go around these structures which means that your shear goes up. So as these, part of, as these little islands build up, your shear goes up, which means that the force that's trying to pull these particles apart also goes up. So there's some balance that's set somewhere, a balance between the electrostatics and the, hydrostat and the, and the hydrodynamic shear, which tells you how many particles you're allowed to build up. Okay? And it turns out that, that if you go through it and you measure from our, from our images and if you measure from the rheometer, um, that it turns out that a you, it's a volume fraction of about 55%. Is what is the balance with under the conditions we're working in, and the what you get from the manufacturer is something like 45 percent. So it's all very consistent. All right. So that was so okay. So that was that was the physics part of the talk, which I know we've already done a lot of calculations. So I'm now going to go on to robots because you guys really need to see pictures of robots. So this is so this is this is the great thing about working with Boston Dynamics is they're amazing. They build amazing robots. Okay. So they said the following. Said okay. Let's, let's think about uh, the following design. OK, so suppose, suppose I have two plates. So I have two plates, and I just push my electroreological fluid through them. Okay, and I have this high voltage switch at the top, so I can turn off and on my voltage. Okay, then they said, well, let's now divide this up into a bunch of pixels. Okay, so there are a bunch of pixels. And I'm now going to put a high voltage switch on each of those pixels, so everything is decoupled. Okay, um, and then they said, ah, OK, so if you do this, you can turn on some of, the, some of the pixels. The chains will form up under there, so nothing will flow. And so now I have a channel that can go through this way. Now if I switch something else off, I can change the architecture of this, and I can have a channel that goes through this way. So I can actually change the physical architecture of my system electronically without moving any parts. No moving parts at all. The fluid just changes from these different states. OK, so they're a robotics company. So they said, OK, so now we have to build it. So they said, OK, uh, so here's the. So here's, there's their pixelated thing. And they did all of these animations, right? Because they're engineers, so they CAD stuff. Okay, so they have a, uh, this an aluminum plate. They have two fixtures over there. These here are now actuators. So the actuator, it's basically, it's just a piston. So there's a piston with a rod coming out of it. Um, so if you apply a, a high pressure over here, this thing will pop out. If you release that pressure, there's a spring that returns it. So it's just a piston that pops in and out, okay? We bought these from McMaster. They're like a dollar a piece, something like that. Okay. Uh, so then, um, let's see. 
So if you go around, so again, they're a robotics company, so now this is the fancy part. So they put legs on it, because <laughs> of course you've got to put legs on it. And then they put a little, a little disco floor on the top so you can tell which of the pixels are, are being activated. Okay? And, um, and there's no cheat, so the way they wired it, the LEDs on top really are connected to the electric field that's being turned on below. Okay? And, uh, and, so, and this is what they built. Okay, so this is the high pressure side, that's the low pressure return. So anytime the, the light is on, there you have uh, your, your field is on, which means that your particle chains have formed, which means that that part is blocked. Anytime the light is off, that means you're allowed to flow through it. And so what this, what this allows you to do is you can make any gate you want, any gate you want in any order you want, just by turning off and on the pixels on, your, on, the, on the back of your robot here. Okay, so, uh, so okay, programmable gates, so he'll go through a bunch of programmable gates. So the thing can run around, fine. Um, but the other thing that's interesting with this um, is that you can also couple legs, right? So because the fluid is incompressible, I can couple this one to that one. I can now couple this one to this one, right? So you can, do, uh, you can basically tie these legs together, again, dynamically. Um, and uh, so now they're going to show the high-speed switching, so they're going to slowly ramp up the switching speed. Um, I think we can actually go much faster than what we're going to show here because um, the, uh, the little piston actuators that we put in there are actually pneumatic actuators. So they're designed to be used by air, and uh, we're, pu we're pumping uh, high, vis uh, high viscosity oil through them. So if we actually got actuators that were designed to use with oil, you could do, you could do even better. Um, this, the actual switching speed for the fluid is something on the order of milliseconds. So, you know, I mean, it's pretty good. I think it's something like 15 milliseconds. 30 milliseconds is probably the, the fastest you can go. Um, so it works. So you can really do these dynamic architectures. Um, and of course, you know, since they're a robotics company, they also build a hand, because you've got to build a hand. Uh, OK, so here, uh, here it is. This is, again, using the electro-rheological valves. So um, this is not a dynamic architecture. These are now fixed valves. Um, but you can see you could really you could manipulate real things with this, right? So you can go out and pick up real things. Uh, let's see. This is, so that's the hand. Um, this, oh, this is the, okay, so this is the finger. So the, the other thing they were, they were just trying to, they were trying to do different kinds of um, uh, motions. Okay, so what they wanted to do is they, they, um, they want to keep the fingertip in one, in one spot. Um, and you can do that, so if, your finger, if you have your finger in one spot, you can do that either by bending this joint or by bending this joint. Okay, and so what you have to do is you have to try to, yeah, so there you go, there I have it going. So you have to keep your fingertip in one spot by, um, by manipulating these two joints. And it's incredibly difficult to do without holding your, the fingertip in place. Okay, so now everybody has to try this with their finger to see if you can make it go. <laughs> and it turns out they don't quite get it right either, but they actually tend to do better than people can do. <laughs> okay, so those are the, so those are the, uh, the electro-rheological valves um, that we have with Boston Dynamics. Um, and like I said, I think I'm going to stop there because it's almost 9.30 and I want to have a chance to chat with you guys. Um, so uh, these are all the people that, um, that worked on that. And um, I'm happy to take any questions you have. <laughs> and seriously, anything you want. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about this or we can talk about whatever you want. It's your master class, so you have me captive for another half hour. Don't be shy. Yeah. Oh, good question. Yeah. So um, the the fingers themselves are actually not that heavy. You know, I mean, it's maybe you know so, something like this probably. But um, the, the thing that's heavy is in the palm. So if you look at the palm, uh, the palm here. So all of the electronics are are in the palm, and so it's the electronics that that get heavy. But the fingers themselves are not bad because you don't you don't actually need all that much fluid in them to make this thing work. Yes, okay, good. So microscales is a really interesting question because, um, so remember in the electro-rheological fluids, there's this magic scale of one to 10 microns for the particles. So in order to get these valves to work, you need to have, let's say, 10 particle widths across the channel, which gives you kind of a minimum scale for the, for, so you can't really go below maybe 100 microns, something, something like that. Um, so, uh, so you're kind of, so to use the ER fluids, you're, you're a little bit limited. Now, uh, 
And the reason is, so, okay, so suppose you, have you guys seen the movies for ferrofluids? So ferrofluid, th these, are these, th these are also all over YouTube. It's, um, you have this, this sort of silver blob of fluid, you put a magnet on, you get all these spiky things coming out of it. Okay, so a ferrofluid, um, it's basically the same as a magnetorheological fluid, except that the particles are smaller. Okay, and when the particles are smaller, then you have Brownian motion, so you never get these stable chains, so you never get the transition to a solid-like state. You don't, get, you, never, you don't get a yield stress, it still flows. So if you, try to, if you try to scale it down too much, so you try to scale it down to something you know, smaller than a micron, um, the, this technology won't, won't work for valving. Yeah? yeah? Actually, maybe you could. Now, you'd have to suppress it without freezing your fluid. So I don't know what the trade-off is. I don't know how much you can suppress it. Probably depends on what, what fluid you, you, you've immersed it in. But yeah, I guess, I guess that's true. If you wanted to build um, very tiny cold robots, you'd be able to do it. What else? Or I can just hang around and you can come and ask me, talk to me. I'd rather just, yeah. yeah. No, no, ask it, ask but it, ask it. It's a very broad, so you yeah. now showed some examples in well known materials, mm -hmm. and so do you have any other things you do with grains? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so actually I have a really interesting granular problem. Okay, so, um, so, the, so in order to make this work, um, what you, what you really want is you want a granular material, this and, and, the, and the grabber that, that Chicago made. Uh, what you really want is a, um, a bag of grains that deforms really, really easily when you don't have any normal stresses on it, but that locks up into a, really, uh, into a, into a very strong state once you, once you pull the vacuum, right? Or here, that's, that flows very easily, but once you put the field on, it locks up into a really strong state. So one thing you could ask yourself is, okay, what shape grains should I use to do that? So, um, and the trade-off is, is as follows. Um, so you could imagine, okay, well, if I had grains that were shaped like puzzle pieces, right, okay, how do I draw a puzzle piece? Right, okay, so, so if I have grains that, that interlock, right, so this would interlock in here somewhere, then you could get a very strong state because they can lock together. But the problem is, it's very difficult to get these guys to interlock. The trade-off is if instead I had a bunch of spheres, it's very easy to get those guys into a hexagonal packing, but once they're there, they're not very strong. So what that tells you is that there should be, well, this is totally hypothetical now. What I think would be interesting to look at, let me put it that way, is let's say I have some shape parameter on this axis. Let's say I go from round to something very complicated. I don't know what that shape, I don't know what parameter takes you from round to complicated, but there are, there are parameters that will do it, okay? So presumably, um, your strength goes up as you go this way, but the ease of packing, and I don't even know what, the, what that term is, but somehow the ease, so ease of packing goes down something like this, which means that the shape you want is this one. So there's a magic shape you should be able to find um, if you could do this analysis. So that's one of the things we're thinking about. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, so we're doing that. We're also thinking about what happens when you, when you mix soft and hard particles, which is, I think, a, a really, another inter really interesting problem because people have done a lot of work on, on hard grains, but once you put um, elasticity into the mixture and then start to mix hard and soft particles, I think there's a lot of interesting physics that comes out of that as well. And soft, putting soft particles into this mix might, might help. Um, yeah, so those are some of the things we're working on. How good? Uh, yeah. putting plastic spheres which have mm -hmm. uh, sticky... Oh, can it, like a, like a, a heat, like a... Like an adhesive particle. An adhesive, yeah, exactly. Or some people have done it with magnets. So they don't do very small spheres, but they have <laughs> magnets also. They'll, they'll stick in different ways. Um, yes, so the, the other problem is, though, that if you're going to use it in robotics, it has to be reversible. So you need an adhesion that you can turn off and on, right? So it has to adhere, but then when you want, it, when you want to shear, it has to let go. So switchable, I mean, switchable adhesion is another great topic. If anybody works on switchable adhesion, that's gold mine there. So, um, yeah. Then with adhesive particles, it's not reversible. It's not reversible, yeah. Well, depending on the, depending on the adhesive, right? I mean, you could, so imagine the following. You could say, okay, I'm just going to have um, uh, slightly wet particles. 
right? So if I have slightly wet particles, then when you bring them together, they have a thin film of fluid, you get surface tension that sticks them together. So now they have adhesion. And you can pull them, you can pull them apart, or you can wait until they dry. And after they dry, then they'll, they'll pull around again, which is a very slow switchable adhesion, but you can switch from a sticky to a non-sticky state. So what you would like is to be able to switch from a sticky to a non-sticky state, not by waiting for a certain amount of time, but by actually having a switch. You can switch to go sticky, non-sticky. That would be cool. That would be very great. If anybody knows how to do that, you should tell me. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's another great question. So, um, so one thing I wish I knew more about was chemistry. Like if, when I look back at what, you know, what I learned in, in college and in grad school, if I'd learned some more chemistry, that would have been helpful. <laughs> so, it, so, I, I, so I'm in no way an expert on chemistry. Um, and I currently don't have any collaborators in chemistry or chemical engineering. But I think that is, you, you know, honestly, I think that's the next step. I think if you're going to start designing these particles, um, you know, if you're going to start, you're, you're now starting to design things on the scale that chemists are interested in. Um, so I think we do need to start thinking about different kinds of coatings, different kinds of um, rough, you know, how, treating different surfaces, doing, changing the roughness of the channel. And these are all things that chemists are very good at. So, um, so I personally don't know any chemistry, but I would love to work with a chemist on this. <laughs> oh, and this is being recorded. Hello, Internet. I would love to work with a chemist on this. <laughs> The yeah. factor you were off by was four, but four. that should depend on the property it, of the... It does. It, it absolutely does. And so if you, look in, if you look in the literature, it's not always four. It might be five. It might be eight. But they always, you always get an overperformance by, by not a few percent, but by, a, you know, by some factor, um, which is sort of in, in that range of you know, three to eight, which is consistent with your particles building up to something that's on the order of 55%. But, it, but you're absolutely right. It, told, it depends on the fluid you're using. It depends on the channel. It depends on whether you're doing pressure-driven flow or, or um, uh, pressure-driven or volume, volumetric-driven flow. I mean, it's, so it, there's, there's many ways that you could, you could under-predict what you're going to get. Yeah. Depends on the geometry of the channel, whether you've got a sharp inlet or a curved inlet. So there, there's lots of things you can do to manipulate that. Yeah. Yeah. Jamming slurp or anything to your tube? Yeah, that how, might. How do you how do you make it go in a certain direction? Oh, if you only vacuum it, it only becomes hard. Yeah. So you're just hanging around. How do you make it curl? Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. So um, if you, so so this is um, so this is another thing I learned working ro with roboticists. Um, I have to say I learned a lot from biologists and roboticists working on both of these projects, all of these projects I've talked about. Um, so one of the things in robotics is having a lot of actuators is bad because actuators, so actuators, motors, something like that, um, cost you, it's high cost, it costs you in weight, and it costs you in complexity. So getting rid of actuators is good. Um, so what we, what we did with our, our trunk, so we have a bunch of these segments. So these are all bags of coffee. Right, so these all have... Okay, and the only actuation we have on here is we've got basically these bags of coffee are tied to a cable. Okay, so there's a cable that runs down here and a cable that runs down here. Okay, and you are allowed to change the length of the cable. Right, so the cable, this cable is attached to a motor and this cable is attached to a motor. Okay, and so this motor can uh, roll and unroll. Okay, so the only two actuators are, are up here. Now, the other thing that you can do is each one of these is connected now to a, something that can draw a vacuum separately. Okay, and these are not actuators. This is just something that you, that you have to, on whatever's controlling your pressure. Okay, so now, by switching these off and on, you can get this thing to take basically whatever shape you want, right, just by having these, these, two, um, these two motors at the top. If you had a third one, then you can do everything in three dimensions. This will give you two dimensions, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great question. Good. 
That's good. You've asked me 10 minutes worth of questions. You only have 20 more to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so I actually love collaborating with industry. And I'd say probably half of my, my projects are industry collaborations. Um, uh, you have to pick your partners fairly closely because you know you want people who are really interested in the fundamental science and can take that fundamental science to, to you know innovate new things in engineering. Um, but we've been very lucky, and part of that I think is because when you live in Cambridge, there are so many companies that are MIT spin-offs. That so Boston Dynamics is an MIT, it's an MIT spin-off. Um, the other one is um, Schlumberger has been the oil company. They, we've done a lot of things with them with both the robots and the granular materials. They also do a lot of a lot of interesting research. Um, uh, we also have um, Battelle has done a, has funded a lot of our things. So Battelle is actually more of a uh, they're not so much a, a like a standard company. They tend to, to fund they're a research funding agency. Um, but but uh, but yeah, actually I actually I love working with the industrial car counterparts. My new thing is I actually want to start bringing in some sports technology companies. So um, we're talk currently working with Patagonia. Is anybody wearing something from Patagonia? I don't know if Patagonia is big in Europe. So Patagonia, they make, they make sports tech clothing. Um, and so they're very interested in making hydrophobic and hydrophilic materials, which is something else that our lab is very interested in. So they've come to talk to us about how do you make hydrophobic and hydrophilic fibers. Um, and they have some very interesting ideas there. So yeah, I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> what would you do in that, in that case? Would, mm -hmm. Because uh, hydrophobic or Hydrophilic. Yeah. That can be some treatment. So what would be your So ah so well so one thing you can do is you can change the roughness. Right. So so uh, so I have there's a guy, uh, a professor in, in our lab, uh, Professor Cullen Buey, who's looking at um, electrophoretic deposition of particles. And so you can very cheaply change the roughness at small scales, which changes the wetting properties of whatever you're you're changing, right? Whatever substrate you're working with. So um, so Patagonia is interested in that kind of technology. But honestly, honestly, we need a chemist for that too. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, we need a chemist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Was there a company interested in the, the clam pot? Yes. Oh, oh, actually, okay. So, so I've got the greatest application for a clam. We've actually been called by a number of a number of people. So we started off in collaboration with Bluefin Robotics, um, and they are developing it as um, as an anchor for one of their their um, underwater vehicles. But the, the application I really want to do, and we've started to talk to some people about this, is underwater cable laying. Okay, so this is the most amazing story I've, well, I've heard many amazing stories in doing this, but this is, this is a good one. So, um, so, you know, they lay cables across the Atlantic, across uh, whatever large bodies of water. If you're going in, in deep water, okay, uh, basically what you do is you, you have the cable um, dragged behind a boat. Okay, so the cable, so here's your boat, the cable comes out this way. And at the bottom of the ocean is something called a sled, and it looks like a big sled, um, and it has some kind of a digging mechanism that buries the cable. And it turns out you have to bury the cable at least two meters underground, um, otherwise the sharks will chew on it because they're attracted to the electric signal. And so you have sharks chewing on your signal. There's probably other reasons why, but that's one of the reasons why you have to bury your cable. Okay, so in deep water this is fine, but if you are close to shore, and by close to shore I mean like, uh, let's say one to five miles, Right, so it's still significant. You, you can't use the sled because the sled only works in deep water. So the way they bury the cable when you're close to shore is they send a guy out in a scuba suit with a shovel who <laughs> digs a trench and puts the cable in it. Right, so it's ex extremely labor intensive. It's extremely hazardous. Right, it takes forever to get these things buried. Um, and uh, so they, what they would like is they'd like a technology to be able to bury these cables near shore. So imagine you have these roboclamps, you hook them onto the cable, right? The, the roboclamp goes on, it digs down, and then it just digs sideways, pulling the cable with it uh, underground, right? And the great thing about this is, and this is why this is such a great robotics problem, is it's attached to a cable. So you don't have to have onboard power, you don't have to have onboard controls, you don't have to do any of these things that are so hard with robotics because you want it to be attached to a cable. So you can route all of your power and all of your controls through the cable. So, um, so honestly, I mean, I, th I, think there's, I, I think there could be a, a really interesting application there. So we're starting to talk to cable laying companies about that. Yeah. Was there any link between the, the, the valves and the, uh -huh. the clamp bot? Oh, yeah. So um, the valve and clamp bot. So um, 
I think the only link is that we started thinking about particles, right? <laughs> so, okay. so my background is really fluids. So before I, I was thinking purely in terms of fluids, what I'll talk about in the, in the plenary talk, I'll talk about swimming in fluids, I'll talk about snails, which is really fluids. Um, and then the clam got us started, started us thinking about particles. Um, when we started talk, talking with Boston Dynamics, we started thinking about soft robotics. So soft robotics, you start to think, well, okay, if you're gonna do something useful, you really have to be able to switch from a soft to a rigid state, which got us thinking about the ER fluids and the MR fluids, which then got us down the path of the valves. <laughs> so there's a, there's a long convoluted chain that got to that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I was wondering yeah. about this digging. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And yeah. 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 Yep, yep. And I was wondering what is the efficiency of this system compared to your bigger Oh, what a, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, that, that's actually a really good question. So we haven't, we haven't compared it to that technology um, because when we were investigating, investigating the clam, we were mostly interested in anchoring. So what we did is we compared the efficiency of our clam to existing anchoring technologies. And if you look at anchoring technologies, um, so, there, so there's many ways to anchor like a boat and I mean, the main way, thing you do is you throw a giant weight over the side, right, and you drag it, okay. Um, and, uh, or you can do things like, um, there's, uh, what's it called? Um, it basically, you shoot an anchor, it's like a gun, and you shoot the anchor into the ground. Um, or there are things like a vibratory anchor, so you basically have, an, uh, have a, a, a weight that's off axis, and you just vibrate it into the ground. And it turns out that the clam beats all of those by an order of magnitude. Um, the one that's closest is the vibratory anchor because it's basically doing what the clam is. It's, it's locally fluidizing the soil. So it does pretty well because it's, it's locally fluidizing the soil, but, we, but the kinematics aren't optimized. It's just random whatever the vibration is, right? So, what I, so going back to your question about Schlumberger, um, what they're doing is fluidization. So I think that's the right thing to do. That's where you're going to minimize your energy requirements and you're going to do best for digging. Um, how that compares to optimal kinematics, I'm, I'm not sure. But I think there is an interesting optimization question there as well, which would be good, interesting to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so that's so expelling. That's exactly the, the issue. So, so currently we don't have a way. So, so if you're going to dig a hole and, and leave an empty hole, you have to remove the mass somehow. So we would have to have something in the clam that would that would get rid of the the excess um, particles. Now, the interesting thing about that movie I showed at the beginning, where it was expelling stuff. So, so it turns out it's it was the clams don't actually use that to help dig. So what they do is the clams are filter feeders. So basically, normally they, they hang around and they have a, a pump which is circ circulating fluid through. So they're pulling in water from the outside which goes through a filter, they eat it and then they expel whatever they want. Okay. So when you startle them and they, they dig to escape, um, what they want to do is they want to basically eject anything, any extra stuff they're carrying so they can focus on digging, right? So that was basically, emptying the hatches for the clam, right? So it was basically, this is all I've got in my filter. I'm going to get rid of it and then focus on digging. Anything else? Good. Okay. Well, so we have 15 minutes, so I'll hang around, but um, you guys can take off or you can ask me questions or, um, or whatever you want, but this has been great. Thanks for, thanks for chatting. <laughs> Thank you.